Maybe it's this. Well, in that little scenario, when did I do the most work? If you thought it was about trying to move this trailer, you're wrong. The most work I did was picking this up. Huh? That seems weird, doesn't it? Well, today I'm going to be talking about work, energy, and the work energy theorem. So stay tuned. In physics, when we talk about work, we need to achieve something. So in both cases, I'm applying forces, forces to my trailer and forces to lift up this branch. But in only lifting up the branch, did I actually achieve something? In this case, I lifted it up. I raised what we call its gravitational potential energy. In other words, I had an outcome. And that is in essence what work is in physics. You apply a force, but you cause a change in the object. It means it causes a displacement. It means it could cause a change in its velocity. It could mean a change in its position relative to a gravitational field. So that in essence is work. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. So let's start simply where we look at an object where we're going to apply a force and cause its displacement. So in this case, I'm applying a force. And if I apply the force strong enough, I'm going to cause a displacement like so. Now in that case, I'm actually putting energy into the system. In other words, I'm putting work into the trailer and I'm doing the work. That's the language we use. And in this case, my force that I'm applying is in the same direction as the displacement. And that is essence what work is. It's the force multiplied by the displacement as long as the two are parallel to each other. If I, for example, try to move the trailer like this, then only the horizontal component is going to give me the work that is required, which means I'm going to have to apply a lot greater force in this angle in order to cause the trailer to move. So if I pull along this, I can pull the trailer, but I can tell you straight away that the force is considerably more than I have to, to cause the same displacement. So what is actually the value of the work done when we are pulling this at an angle? Well, the force that we require is only the horizontal component. So therefore, the force that is actually doing the work is F, which is the force along here, multiplied by the cos of the angle here. That multiplied by my displacement of my trailer will give me the amount of work done. And therefore, that's the energy I'm putting into the system. That is why the unit for work is the joule, the same unit that we use for energy. So in essence, when you do work, you're usually putting energy into the system or taking energy out of the system. By moving, in this case, my trailer, I am causing a displacement, and therefore I'm changing the object's energy. Now, as you notice, as I return it, I'm slowing it down, and now the displacement is in the opposite direction. And so what we do here is that because my force is in this direction, but my displacement is in that direction, my work in this case is a negative value. So if a value is negative in terms of work done, it means that the force and the displacement, although they are parallel, they are in opposite directions. Now, what would happen if I needed to move the trailer at this angle? Well, it's pretty clear in order for this force to be big enough to accommodate moving my trailer, I'm going to have to require a lot of force. So if I do this, it's quite difficult. And in fact, almost too difficult. So in this case, the trailer is not moving, which means that I have done no work because there's no displacement. And that's an important critical point, that if there is no displacement, you aren't putting work into the system. You're not changing the object's potential energy, you're not changing the object's kinetic energy, you're not changing anything, and so no work is done. So now let's see how work and energy are related in what's often referred to as our work energy theorem. So let's first start off with the concept of potential energy. I'm going to take my car and I'm going to lift it up. In other words, I'm applying a force in that direction and its displacement is in that direction. Now, all of a sudden, I have an increase in stored energy, which referred to potential energy, but in this case, it's a gravitational potential energy. So how much energy did I change it by? I increased its gravitational potential energy. Well, the force I applied is its weight, so that's mg, 
and the displacement is its height. So now what we have is gravitational potential energy, or at least the change thereof, is equal to mgh. So now you see that the work, Fs, is equal to mgh. And of course, if I lower it, it's going to be negative. I have a drop in gravitational potential energy. Again, I'm applying a force in that direction, but my displacement is in that direction. So I have negative work and I have a drop in gravitational potential energy. Now see what we talk about in terms of kinetic energy. Now kinetic energy is where we talk about a change in its energy in terms of its motion. So kinetic energy is moving energy. And so how do we see that? Well, here's my car and I'm going to apply a force and cause it to have a displacement over that time. Well, my car has increased in velocity. It started at zero and ended up with another velocity. And what we're going to do now is we're going to show how the force multiplied by the displacement allows us to work out the change in kinetic energy. Let's have a look. So here I have my toy car and it's going down a ramp and we're going to use our concept of work and energy to develop a formula for the kinetic energy. In other words, by combining Newton's second law, our understanding of work, and also an equation of motion, we're going to actually determine the actual mathematical relationship of the kinetic energy in connection to its mass and also its velocity. So here's my little toy car, and just to let you know, this toy car I've had since a childhood. It's one of my old toy cars in, that I keep as memorabilia. And the car, of course, rolls down the ramp like so, starting at initial velocity of zero and ending up with some sort of non-zero velocity. So let's label those things on our table. So we have our initial velocity here, which is in our case zero, but it can also be a non-zero value. And then we have my final velocity down the bottom. We have our ramp, which is going to have a displacement of s. And then finally, we know that it's going to accelerate down the ramp with some sort of acceleration. The value at this stage doesn't matter. All we need to know is that the acceleration is a constant one at this case. So as I said, we're going to combine a couple of things for the work energy theorem. The first one is Newton's second law. The second one is our work, of course, is equal to the force multiplied by the displacement. And we need to find some way of connecting the energy transformation that's occurring here by ways in connecting to its velocity. So what we need to do is then combine an equation of motion. And the equation of motion I'm going to be using is v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. When we combine those two formulas together, we're going to get our work is equal to simply our force, which of course is m multiplied by a multiplied by my displacement. So we get mas. And then my equation of motion here, I'm going to rearrange. And if you look carefully, I can go v squared minus u squared all over 2 is equal to as. So I'm going to substitute that in. So I get the work done is equal to the mass multiplied by v squared minus u squared all over 2. You get a half mv squared minus a half mu squared. So there what we have, our work changes an object's kinetic energy. So that tells us that the kinetic energy, and we use the symbol k, is equal to simply a half mv squared. That is, what is its velocity squared multiplied by its mass divided by 2. That gives you the energy. Notice it is a square relationship. So if you double an object's velocity, its kinetic energy doesn't double. It actually quadruples, goes four times higher. When we see this here in our work relationship, work can change that kinetic energy. And so here what we have literally is the change in kinetic energy. And so there is our relationship with work and kinetic energy. So as you can see, that force times displacement results in a change in kinetic energy in this case. So there's a connection there between work and kinetic energy. Now that's true also if we slow it down. In this case, the change in kinetic energy is actually a negative value, so my work is negative because let's say if the car's already moving and I'm applying a force in the opposite direction, and then as a result, I'm going to slow it down, I'm going to change its kinetic energy and it's going to be a negative value. So now let's put this all together. You will now see that I now have a ramp that is now sloping. And so what I'm going to do is going to put all those things together. First of all, let's look at it from this perspective. Let's say I've got my car down here and I'm going to push it up the ramp. 
Well, what am I doing? I'm increasing its potential energy. It's moving higher. But the change in potential energy is equal to the force times the displacement. So this force is actually reasonably weak as long as my displacement is reasonably long, which it is. Now, just a little side here. Just because I have a long ramp, I can do the same amount of work by simply lifting it that particular height to this particular point. Now, obviously, I have to apply a greater force here for a shorter displacement. In this case, I apply a sm much smaller force for a much larger displacement. And you'll see that you still get the same value. That is F times S times the cos of the angle. I give a story to my students often and I say, look, we've got two students and they're both removalists after school and they both are lifting a fridge on top of a one meter high truck. And one takes a very long ramp and one decides to show his strength by lifting it on top by going straight up. And I ask the question, who does the greatest amount of work? Well, both have the same amount of change in potential energy. So they do the same amount of work. Even though for one, the force is much larger for a shorter displacement, the other is a much larger displacement for a smaller amount of force. So, in any case, let's now take our ramp and push the car up. I'm applying a force and it's moving up the ramp and I'm increasing its potential energy. If I just did a small force, then you can see eventually it stops. Why? Well, I'm losing kinetic energy. The work is done, in this case, by the Earth's gravitational field, and I'm losing kinetic energy. But the trade-off is, is I'm gaining potential energy. So the gain in potential energy is equal to the loss in kinetic energy. That's true for the reverse. I now have a higher amount of potential energy than at the end of the ramp. It's higher by a value of mgh. What happens when I let go? Well, it starts gaining kinetic energy and starts losing potential energy. And as a result, what we have in this case, we have a loss of potential energy and a gain of kinetic energy. But here's the critical thing. The amount's exactly the same. So what does that mean? Well, it tells me that if I work out the total kinetic energy I have and the total potential energy I have here, it's going to be the same at the other end. And what we say is, is that energy is conserved. The total energy remains the same. And that's a very important principle called the law of the conservation of energy. No energy is created, no energy is lost. So now let's have a look at the conservation of energy through some graphical analysis. And to start off, we need some data. And here I have some uh, theoretical data. It's not exactly the situation you saw before. I have a ramp in this case of 30 degrees. I have a ramp length of two meters. And my mass of the car in this case is 300 grams. Now it's not 300 grams, it's a bit lighter than that. But at least in this case, what we can do is we can generate some data. And by the way, this spreadsheet of data, I have a file for that, I'm going to put it a link in the description so that you can play around with that data yourself. And you see I have a whole series of, of columns here. I have here is the displacement as measured from the bottom of the ramp. So we start two meters away from the bottom and we end up close to zero. We see also the vertical height, which starts as one meter up and ends up also to zero. And of course that allows me to work out the potential energy because the potential energy is equal to mgh. Then I have the velocity as we go down the ramp. It starts at zero in our case and ends up with a velocity of around 4.4 meters per second. And that allows me to work out my kinetic energy. And you know that is equal to a half mv squared. The total energy is the sum of those two values and we're always going to get 2.94. We have conservation of energy. Now, we can see this better if we graph this. So a good graph would be a continuous graph. And so what I have here is a graph that shows us the, the relationship between those three. So you can see my blue line, which is my uh, potential energy. And you can see it slowly starts to decrease to the top and gradually increases in dropping as we go along, as the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. Similarly, the kinetic energy starts at zero and starts to increase gradually and then at a much greater pace until its maximum value over here at roughly 0.9 seconds. But the critical thing is, is that if we add all these values together, we're going to get a constant value, which is this gray line here at the top, which is the total energy. 
Now you shouldn't normally do this and graph it in terms of column graphs because this is continuous data and you use column graphs for discrete data, but I've done it nonetheless to hopefully help you understand it if you're still not sure. So what I have here is another graph and this, in this case, my graph is a column graph and it tells me the potential energy and the kinetic energy, but you can see that when we stack them on top of each other, the total is always the same. Kinetic converts to potential, potential converts to kinetic, the total is always the same. Now, the reality of course is, in a perfect system, then the total potential energy and the total kinetic energy is equal to the total potential energy plus the kinetic energy, but it's not gonna be exactly the same because you might notice we're hearing sound. Well, we're losing a little bit of energy in terms of sound and heat and so forth. So what about our example where we're losing some energy? The total energy, if we just look at the kinetic and potential, it doesn't actually add up to the total energy. Why? Because in an inefficient system, we're going to lose some energy in terms of heat and sound or other forms of energy that may be released that we can't take back. But the conservation of energy is still always true. So what I've done here is I've taken the data and I've allowed for a loss of energy in terms of a percentage, in terms of the kinetic energy. The speed that you're going to get is not exactly determined by the total potential of the energy you have or losing at that time. So what I have here is my potential energy. You can see it's decreasing. My kinetic energy is increasing, but you'll notice that if I've tracked that along, I actually have less total energy. But if I include the gray area, the gray area represents the energy in relation to maybe heat that's generated or light that's generated or uh, sound that's generated. And as a result, when we are able to capture that, so to speak, we can add that up and that is equal to the total energy of the whole system. So that's the principle of the law of conservation of energy. The total energy that you have in the system, although there may be transfers and transformations of energy as we go along, the total remains the same. In summary, when you do work, you apply a force over a certain displacement and as a result the object changes. Now that can result in a change of kinetic energy, a change in potential energy, or it could actually be both. I hope that's helped you understand the concept of work and concept of energy and how the two are connected by the work energy theorem. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Please like, share and subscribe, ring the bell to make sure you get the latest updates and check out my website too and follow me on Twitter. Take care, bye for now.